And we have a lot on the agenda, so let's get started. Um, welcome. We will begin with introductions, but just to note, I think you all, all members know that um, Aton could not be here tonight. And so I have the unenviable position of trying to fill his shoes to keep this meeting moving. Please don't have any expectations of me like you would of Aton. That's an impossible job. Uh, but I'll do my best. And um, of course, Aton did so much behind the scenes work, even though he's not supposed to be working right now. Um, so we can all give him a hard time about that when we see him. But let's do introductions. And oh, I should just also note that our um, Grant Taylor, our minutes taker, cannot be here tonight either. But he assured me that he would um, review the recording. And so we will have minutes of this meeting per our open meeting law responsibilities. Um, okay, let's go around and just say um, um, who, we are, who we are, yo, yeah. Are you gonna actually, re you're not recording it right now, so. I you... don't, yeah, thank you. I don't have to record because we have here um, helping us with that Orca Media. So, and okay. I don't have to do that piece, but thank you, because that is often something I forget when I say I'm gonna do it. Um, so, Hi, everybody. Erin Jacobson, and I am the Attorney General's Office designee to this amazing panel. And I'm just going to go down my list of folks. Next on the list of participants here, I have Matthew Bernstein. Hi, everyone. My name is Matthew Bernstein. My pronouns are he, him. I am the child, youth, and family advocate for Vermont and attending as a committee member. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. Judge Morrissey. Hi, my name is Mary Morrissey. I'm with the I'm one of the Vermont Superior Court judges, and I am the judiciary's representative on this committee. And we can see your face now, so that's yes. Nice. I figured out all I had to do was slide that thing uh, on the oh. top. Of the screen. Yeah, it wasn't all that complicated. <laughs> it was mechanical, not technical. Yeah, good. no, it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't too tough. Yeah, good. Um, Christine Hughes. Hi, everyone. Am I, is there a prompt? Am I supposed to explain? Oh, you can just say hi. And if you want to mention um, your role on the RDAP or just an interested community member, if you want to add anything like anything official or not, you can just say hi. Hi, I'm hi. Uh, the director of the Richard Kemp Center in Burlington, and I was the first chair of the RDAP. So it's nice to be here. Um, yeah, that's who I am. And I probably won't leave my camera on if that's okay i mean i could turn it on if i have something to say but i'd prefer to just listen that's great we have no protocols about that kind of thing okay. so make yourself comfortable nice and also you, Aaron. yeah you too hi um my little list here on the on the margin of my um of my zoom is flip-flopping so i I will likely forget someone. I apologize in advance. You all can help me make sure that we everyone gets to say hi. Um, next you. on my list is Chris Loris. Yeah, Christopher Loris. I'm a research associate with Crime Research Group here observing. Full disclosure, I am also an appointee to the Vermont Criminal Justice Council, but I am not wearing that hat tonight. Thank you. Welcome, Dan Bennett. Hi, Dan Bennett of Vermont State Police. I work for the Fair and Impartial Policing Committee, and I'm sort of Eton's right hand man. Um, he's doing really well. I brought him home today, and um, he's definitely uh, a little upset that he couldn't attend to say the least. So, well, thank you for being here, Dan, and I appreciate that positive report. I'm glad he's on the mend. Doing great. Uh, good. Really glad to hear that. Um, Derek, meet up next. That was so well pronounced, Aaron. Thank you for that. <laughs> I don't need to repeat my correctly pronounced and difficult last name, but I am the Department of Corrections uh, designee uh, to the RDAP. And um, my pronouns are he, him, and it's uh, nice to uh, reconvene. Thanks. Thank you, Derek. Elizabeth Morris. Hi there, I'm Elizabeth Morris. I am the Juvenile Justice Coordinator. Um, 
at the Adolescent Services Unit at DCF. Um, I am not the designee um, for DCF. That is Tyler Allen. Thank you, Elizabeth. Good to see you. Um, Emily, and then my little trusty list trails off, so I can't actually see your whole last name. Emily Magus Russell. Hi. Yep, you got it. Thanks. Hi, y'all. I'm M or Emily Magus Russell. Uh, she, they pronouns, and I am joining you all. Um, to maybe talk a little bit at some point about the Brattleboro Community Safety Review process. Great, welcome. Thank you for being here. Jen Furpo. Hi there, Jen Furpo. I'm representing the Vermont Police Academy as their designee. Hey. <laughs> uh, also grilling. You. Oh, wow. Lucky you. I'm waiting for my children to bring me takeout that I'll eat it eight o'clock. Uh, Jennifer Pullman. Hi, I'm Jennifer Pullman. I'm the director of the Vermont Center for Crime Victim Services. I'm not an official member, but I've been hanging out for a bunch of meetings. So thank you for including me. And thank you for being here. Um, Representative Arsenal. Hi, everyone. I am uh... A representative Arsenault, I guess. My name is Angela. Uh, she, her pronouns, and I am a representative from Williston. I serve on the Judiciary Committee, um, so I'm here as a very interested listener, observer type. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rebecca Turner. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Rebecca Turner, designee for the Office of the Defender General panel member. Jeffrey Jones. Yes, sorry, I had to jump off because my dog just grabbed something off the table and ran away. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what should I be saying? Just saying hi. And, hi, everyone. Um, and, what, and why you're here. <laughs> uh, I guess uh, original um, panel member. Um, the question of why I'm here is an interesting one. I'll leave it to you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, and then I think we have um, Reverend Hughes. Hey, good evening, everyone. I'm Reverend Mark Hughes. I am the executive director of the Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. And um, yeah, just pop in every now and then. Uh, this was a um, result of our work from Act 54 and 17. Great. Thank you. Um, Sheila Linton. Good evening, everyone. Sheila Linton, she, her, her pronouns, um, original panel member. Thank you. Shay Witzberger. Hey, all. Shay Witzberger, they, them pronouns, here as one of the co authors to talk about the Brattleboro Community Safety Review with M. Megas Russell. Uh, my, in my other life, uh, I'm also, I work at the Safe Space LGBTQ Anti-Violence Project. Great. You. Thank you for being here, Shay. Mm -hmm. And Taisha Green. I hope I said your name right. Please correct me if I did not. You did. You did say my name right. Okay, good. Hi, everybody. Okay. My name is Taisha Green. Um, happy to see some familiar faces on this call. I am the former director of the REIB, and I am here to uh, talk about the CNA report that the REIB did in 2021. Super. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Laura Carter. Hi, everybody. My name is Laura Carter. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am one of the data analysts in the Division of Racial Justice Statistics within the Office of Racial Equity. I believe uh, Tiffany will be here as well, but I know Susanna will not be. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Um, Tyler Allen. Good evening, everybody. My name is Tyler Allen. I think I am still at present the designee from DCF because um, I'm not seeing Rachel Edens here. So perhaps that transition hasn't happened yet, but it is wonderful to see everybody. Thanks, Tyler. You too. Uh, Witchy, R2. 
Hi everyone, name is Wichi Artu, pronounce he, him, his. I am a health equity and data systems expert uh, brought in by, appointed by the Office of Racial Equity to this committee. I'm also executive director at Vital Partnerships, uh, a consulting agency focused on community owned, community organ organizing. Uh, and I am on the community safety review subcommittee along with Sheila. Great, thank you, Wichi. And Winston Longmore. Hello, everybody. My name is Winston Longmore. Um, I am the director of outreach and wellness. And I've been, um, this is actually, I believe, my second or third time on these um, on these calls. So I'm happy to be here again and just uh, learn about what's going on. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here again. I think. I just need to call on maybe Isaac, though I don't see a last name. Thank you. This is Isaac Owusu. I'm the Director of Community Engagement and Support with the uh, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance. And uh, I think we're strong stakeholders in this matter. So here I am. Thank you for having me. Indeed you are. Thanks for being here. Oh, I'm sure I'm forgetting Somebody, uh, Professor Did I Brown. Miss my name, Professor Brown. No. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jessica Brown. She, my pronouns are she/her. Um, I am a an at-large community member appointee to this panel. Um, former public defender, current assistant professor, uh, and director of the Center for Justice Reform at Vermont Law Graduate School. Great. I think now I might have gotten everybody, but please, if I miss one of you, could you just speak up? Yeah, I'm Don Stevens. I'm uh, Oh Ethan. my gosh. <laughs> I'm pretty for the Nolhegan tribe. I was uh, appointed by the attorney general. Uh, been on the panel for, I don't know, five or six years. Uh, I've been absent for a little while, so I apologize for that. But anyway, I'm also the executive director of Abenaki Help and Abenaki um, that helps the uh, our community. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I'm so sorry that I missed your name. You're right at the top of the list now, too. So no worries. No, no worries. No, no excuses there. Um, okay. Is that everybody? Great. Um, so we'll get to the agenda announcements. We all know Aton's not here. I mentioned that. Um, because Aton is not here, I would just ask that we not make any big decisions. So the agenda is kind of um, designed around that. We are going to hear reports out from our subcommittees and hopefully um, we'll learn a lot about the work of the sub subcommittees, but also um, with an eye toward our report that we have to really get serious about drafting and thinking about what is going to go into our report um, for the legislature that I believe we're, we're trying to get to them by January or February, 2024. Uh, that will be here like, it'll feel like tomorrow whenever there's a due date. Um, it'll It's coming up quick. So um, towards the end of the meeting, that's another thing we wanna make sure we've discussed is what do we envision going into the report? Again, not making any big decisions tonight, um, but we, Aton did ask that we start getting serious about that. So um, with those announcements from me, does anyone else have any announcements? Okay. I do. Oh, good. I, yes, very exciting. So I just wanted to say that today is actually... I am the co-founder and executive director of the Root Social Justice Center in Brattleboro, which is a all BIPOC run organization on centering blackness and growing a movement for racial justice. And today is our official 10 year anniversary. And yes, yes, yes. Yay. And we are kicking off our um, 10 year fundraising campaign as well as we invite all of you. Thank you, Shay. Thank you everybody. <laughs> we invite all of you to attend our 10 year anniversary party happening on October 7th, 
which is Indigenous Peoples Weekend. And we're inviting people from statewide. Uh, we are doing a racial justice parade, um, meeting at the Root Social Justice Center at 11, kicking off the parade at noon. It's a very short route um, through the middle of town. And then we are going to be carpooling out to Susu Community Farm, which is one of our wonderful sibling peoples, um, where we will party there from two to six. You can find out more information on our website or on Facebook, if you like, the Root SJC org and um, I really hope that you come and bring your families and friends everyone is invited and thank you all for those of you for, uh, who have contributed or supported or volunteered for our organization we couldn't have done it without you so thank you everybody thank you for your leadership Sheila and congratulations thank you Christine that is fantastic um, can you say the date and time again of the parade, please? Just so we all have it. October 7th, the parade will kick off at noon at the Root Social Justice Center in Brattleboro, which is 28 William Street. Okay. 11 o'clock if you want to come make signs and be prepared and ready, but it will kick off from there at noon. Cool. Thank you, Sheila. Any other announcements? Yeah. Um, hi, Aaron. Can you hear me? This is Matthew. I can, Matthew. Go for it. Oh, thanks. I just wanted to say real quick that, um, well, first I wanted to thank Sheila for her leadership um, on so many issues, including the creation of uh, the Office of the Child, Youth, and Family Advocate, and um, also just a lot of support to me personally and professionally. So um, I will do my best to make it, Sheila. That's, that's amazing. Um, and if you could put that info in the chat, that would help me uh, get there. And just a quick announcement, um, we're, we're co-hosting a, a webinar on youth homelessness, which is a week from today, um, Tuesday, September 19th from 12 to 1.30 on Zoom. And um, it's going to be really awesome where we've been a little bit late getting the word out, but, um, but please join us. We've got an amazing um, panel and a bunch of folks with lived experience and a bunch of awesome policy people. So it's going to be a mix of um, and um, all Vermont folk, a little bit of national, but mostly Vermont focus and, and a focus on lived experience and the experience of BIPOC and LGBTQ youth. So um, please join us. I'll put the, the registration link in the chat. And thanks so much. Thank you, Matthew. And by the way, there is no chat because it creates issues oh. with open meeting laws. So oh, I won't do if, that. Sorry. So you won't be doing that. And Sheila can't put the um, celebration info in the chat, but do feel free to use this, our email list as a good, um, content. I'm not sure I have access to that, Lauren, to but sorry, I called you Lauren. I'm not sure I have access to that, Aaron, but, um, uh, I'll check. And if not, maybe if I could just email you the link. That yeah, would... you can send anything Thank to you. me and I'm happy to share it around. Thank you. As long as oh. it's not anything where we would be doing business or making decisions, because again, if that goes out in an all group email, then that constitutes a meeting under open meeting laws. You can see that I'm all very concerned about following those rules tonight now that I'm in charge. Okay, Elizabeth Morris, do you have an announcement? Yeah, I just have a couple of um, funding opportunities that I was going to put in, say I was going to put in the chat, but I will email the links to you. Um, so one is for youth drop-in centers um, across the state. Um, and another one is regarding the beginnings of a programming specifically for emerging adults um, who are either court adjudicated or at risk for intimate partner violence because um, there is currently no program specific for that age group. Um, and both of those fundings are coming from the um, Council for Equitable Youth Justice, which is a, another public public group um, as well. So I'll, I'll send those to you, Erin, um, so you can um, you know, share them with the group. Good, thank you, that's exciting. Any other announcements? Reverend Hughes. Hey, thanks, Aaron. And I just wanted to mention that we're in our last days of hosting the uh, 1619 Traveling Exhibit uh, over at the Richard Kim Center. And we've recently deployed uh, a, um, a cultural arts uh, permanent uh, display at the, at the center, which was just uh, commissioned over the last few days called Diaspora, which is uh, it's going to be there. But the first African landing day um, it, traveling exhibit. If you want to stop by and take a peep at that, uh, I think I think you can do that between. I think it's probably between noon and like five or something like that uh, over the next couple of days. 
And I just wanted to give a shout out for um, for Black Affinity Space uh, on uh, Thursday and game night on Friday, where there are some uh, pretty lively uh, spades games happening usually. If you want to drop in and get your, get your butt handed to you, because um, there will be some trash talking going on. Uh, and also want to um, just let uh, Sheila know uh, just how excited we are because we're going to be all hands on deck, uh, as, as many of us as possible, uh, down in your neck of the woods uh, to support you uh, the day before and leading up to and through uh, that. Uh, and I'm going to apologize in advance for having to hop off the call uh, because I need to go to another call. Um, but um, thank you uh, so much again, Sheila, for all you guys are doing down there. I can't wait to see you. And thank you for coming up for um, First African Landing Day. It was good to see you. Thanks, Mark. Do you know the the last day of the 1619 exhibit? Did you say what the last day was? I think it's Friday. I think the okay. last day is at the end of the day on Friday. Okay, thank you. That's really good to know. Any other announcements? Okay, then without, oh no, I know what we have to do. Two businessy things. Does anyone have anything to add to the agenda or does anyone want to suggest any changes to the agenda? Aaron, could I just ask you a quick question? Sure. So I heard you mention to people if they send stuff to you, you could send it out. Cause I definitely do have a, a, um, a couple of things I'd like to share with you, but I'm just curious about like who who's the list? Where does it go? Well, if you send it to me, I can get it to Aton, and then Aton, as the chair of this panel, um, okay. can share it out. Yeah, okay. but I just want Great. to, because we don't use the chat, it can be tricky to kind of get information out um, okay. uh, that's on that's a document that's on paper. So that's what I think we'll do with it. Just send it to me, and I'll make sure Aton gets it, and then we can share it around. Okay, thank you. Thank you. No modifications to the agenda, I hope. Hope we have enough to get through, I think, without adding anything, but um, okay, doesn't sound like it. Then we have to approve our minutes from our August meeting. Can I get a motion? I move to accept our uh, previous minutes from the August, 2023 meeting. Thank you. Any seconds? I'll second that. Super. Thank you, Tyler. Any discussion? All right. All in favor, please raise your hand or say aye. I think that's everybody. Oh, look, your hands show up in the participants list. That is helpful. Erin, I'm abstaining yes. for the minutes. I was not at the last meeting. This is Sheila. Thank you, Sheila. Yep. And I'm abstaining too because I wasn't there either. Okay, this is so on. Chief Stevens and Sheila Linton <laughs> abstaining. Any other extensions? Any objections? All right. Now we get to the fun stuff. Cool. Well, I did love the announcements also. Um Okay, so I'm going to turn it over for our first report out um, from the Community Safety Subcommittee. I believe that means I'm handing this discussion and presentation over to Sheila and Witchy. Take it away, please. Yeah, awesome. I can I can go ahead and start. Um, apologies, I'm gonna have to keep my camera off. I'm having I'm starting to get a headache for you know, those six o'clock Zoom meeting headaches when you've been on Zoom meetings all day, that one. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I, I want to really appreciate um, Shay, Taisha, uh, M for coming with us today uh, to talk a little bit about the community safety reviews. So the subcommittee is me, Sheila, and Singh. Uh, Singh is not here today, but between me and Sheila, I feel like um, we have enough questions to ask of you, um, especially you know if if there's extra time. Uh, 
I wanted to ask before I begin, is there a preference for having uh, Taisha go first as a, uh, for the Burlington CN uh, community needs assessment or having uh, and then or having Brattleboro go first or having you y'all go at the same time? Is there a preference for that? Defer to you and Sheila as kind of the the co chairs of the subcommittee. However, you would like to to go about it is fine with me. Thanks, Erin. Yeah, and I'll put that back out to the presenters of what is best for them and their timing of tonight or um, so have you. Uh, I am okay. So whatever. I mean, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. Whenever y'all are ready for me to go. You want to go for it? <laughs> Start us off. <laughs> sure, I could go for it. Um, Thank you. Again, no problem. Again, my name is Taisha Green. I'm the former director of the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Office for the City of Burlington. Um, in 2021, we did a um, operational, functional, and operational assessment of the Burlington Police Department, uh, and that was led by my office. Um, I am just here to to answer questions as far as I understand. I know I have a list of questions from, from Witchy. And if y'all want me to start there, I can. Yeah, I would um I would love for you to um start there. Maybe uh talk about um, you know, why was sort of like as an introduction, why was the uh community needs assessment created in the first place? What was the need uh that was that this was trying to address? You're muted. Then, thank you. The needs assessment was created uh, by city council, as far as I understand. Um, it um, came through a resolution. Uh, there were two parts to the assessment. One was a community-based um, um, kind of like focus group, trying to figure out and hear from the community what they um, thought that they wanted in in their police department, what problems did they see. Um, that discussion with the community, it was probably a good eight meetings. Um, I know that we went to every single like neighborhood organization meeting and we um, had the Talitha, who, was who, who we hired for that portion of it, they came in and they did a, a qualitative analysis of, of that data that they received from the community. Second part of that was the CNA um, portion. And, and CNA is an organization who uh, does police reform. Um, they're known around the country for doing so. Um, they follow best practices and uh, 20th century um, policing models, mostly. Um, they have a lot of former law enforcement personnel on their, on their team. Uh, they have uh, data people. They have people with PhDs. It, it was a pretty... Uh, succinct and a, a very um, broad level of understanding of, of what needs to happen in Burlington. So it came through the resolution. Um, I believe that resolution was in December of 2021. I'm sorry, 2020 or either January of 2021. Um, <clears throat> and I was appointed by that resolution to manage this project, this uh, process. My role was basically to be a conduit between CNA and, and the Burlington Police Department. So there was a lot of data gathering that needed to happen. Um, so it was my job and my team's job to make sure that data got from the police department to CNA so that they can analyze that data. Um, giving them lists of people that they should interview, uh, like the mayor, the chief of police, certain people in the police department, certain community members. I know that the Racial Justice Alliance was uh, part of that as well. And I believe that Mark was probably one of the interviewees for that. Um, and we also talked to the Battery Park, Battery Street Park uh, movement on folks as well for that. Um, we talked to the Burlington Police Union. There were, there were several people that were talked to. We talked to Church Street Marketplace. There were a lot of interviews that happened in that process, but my role um, was generally to uh, give CNA the space to do their job, but also to encourage the police department to uh, do their job and, and give us all the data that we need. 
Thank you, Taisha. Um, and uh, uh, anyone can can pop in for for questions. I feel like this can be a a, a good open collaborative space. Um, I just have a quick follow up question on that. Was there any emphasis on uh, assessing needs for communities of color, or is, or is was it just uh, a general broad uh, uh, broad approach? The entire resolution was focused on communities of color. Um, so it uh, happened. Uh, shortly after the murder of George Floyd, there were two different uh, resolutions. Um, one happened in, in June, and that was the one to, uh, I know people like to call it defunding the police, but I, I, I disagree. Um, it was one that when a police officer leaves, and so through attrition, um, the funds for that police officer would be dispersed to help community, in particular, Black and brown communities. Uh, for the city of Burlington. Um, they had put a 74 uh, person cap on, on the police department in Burlington. Uh, and that became a really large political battle um, as far as from the mayor's office and in the police department as well. Uh, I believe at the time Burlington had a cap of like 115 officers. Um, and one of my uh, um, discussions uh, surrounding that was, I, I live in Minneapolis and I came from the city of Bloomington, um, which is a suburb of Minneapolis. <clears throat> Bloomington has an international MSP, International Airport, which is two. So they have the Humphrey Terminal and the main term terminal. They have the Mall of America. Uh, they have about 85,000 residents and they have 115 sworn officers. So in my head, it was like, well, you have Burlington, which is about 40,000 soaking wet. Um, you have a really small airport, um, which could be considered a regional airport, but I know it's considered an international one. Um, and, you know, Bloomington also had three colleges and 50 colleges within a 20 mile radius of, of the city of Bloomington. And so the argument from uh, the, the people who wanted to keep that cap at 116 or 115 was that they have an airport and they have UVM and they have, you know, all of these things, but so does Bloomington and Bloomington is, is a lot larger and they have a lot more people coming in on a regular basis, <clears throat> excuse me, because of the Mall of America, which gets millions and millions of uh, um, people coming in from across the world every year. Um, and it is also on the uh, target list for, for terrorists. So there's a lot of uh, DOJ presence in, in the city of Bloomington because of terrorism. But um, I, I just didn't see how the two compared. So um, one of the key findings of this report <clears throat> um, on page Roman numeral four said that the city of Burlington should only have 72 to 75 sworn officers. Um, that really, like I said, became a key contention in, in this, entire, this entire thing. Um, and most of the focus went towards that number and not towards the substance of, of the, the report itself. But to get back to your question, Witchy, uh, you said um, your question was, was this focused on BIPOC people? And yes, to answer your question, yes, it was. Thank you. That was that was very insightful. I really appreciated that comparison because uh, I think we maybe get a different view of it uh, through the news. Um, so it was interesting to hear that perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm hoping to know, you know, if uh, from your proposal, what kind of positive impacts have we seen um, in BIPOC communities? <clears throat> um, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so okay. the uh, positives, I would say the implementation of the CSOs, which started, um, I know that this report uh, says that it started before the report, which is true, but it also started with that same resolution after the murder of George Floyd, um, which put the cap at 74, and the implementation of CSOs were um, uh, asked for by, by city council at that time. So when I left, I think we had two CSOs in the city of Bloomington. Um, I'm sorry, city of Burlington. Uh, I'm not sure how many they have now. I hope that they have a substantial number. Uh, to handle um, most of the calls that are, don't require uh, an armed police officer, um, and especially the calls that that have mental health issues attached to it. So 
Um, but they had two at the time that I left and they had one at the time of this report. So I would say that is probably a good, a good change that came um, with this report, but it also started well before this report. Got it. And do you mind uh, defining CSO for us? Uh, community service liaison, community service officers, and then there was also CSLs, which are community service liaisons. Um, I think that the CSOs receive more uh, training as far as um, going to the police academy training, whereas the CSLs do not. So um, it is my understanding that they are both unarmed, though. Got it. So Please correct sort of... me if I'm wrong, but that's my my under, my general um, recollection of it. And these are different from police officers. These are just um, unarmed uh, workers from the police department who uh, do patrolling or? Uh, they, they don't necessarily, I don't believe that was one of their goals was to patrol. I think, I, I know that they did need to have a, a link to the community. So they need to be a trusted member of a community. So um, I know that that was one of the search criteria for them. Uh, I'm not sure that they patrolled, but I know that they went out on calls um, the same way that patrol officers did to uh, um, houselessness, um, people with drug addiction, um, people who are having a mental health crisis, um, things of that nature. So, Got it. Thank you. Um, can you share with us uh, maybe some of the biggest challenges that came into either um, the creation of this report or implementing the recommendations? Yeah, yeah. Um, so the bi biggest challenge was the police department, um, in my view. Uh, the police department uh, refused uh, for months to to give up any data uh, to CNA. Um, and it after the CNA, so there were two reports that were done. Um, one was done at the end of August in 2021, and the other one was done at the end of September. Um, so when they did the first report, because they weren't getting that data, they assumed that data did not exist. Um, and so they put some recommendations in to say, this is what you need to do because this is what we asked for and you did not supply it. So we assume that this data does not exist. Um, after in, in the beginning of September, the police department finally gave like a really big dump of data, but it was too late at that point to, uh, the CNA contract had run its course. They had done their work. Um, they had asked for an extension to try to get the police department on board. Um, and even with that extension, the police department still would not cooperate with this with this uh, this assessment. So um, I would say that the police department was the biggest uh, hindrance in this, but also the mayor's office, because the mayor's office did not step in to uh, ensure that the police department were doing what they needed to do. Uh, just to clarify, um, that data did not get reported to the state. That was just data local to the Burlington Police Department? Um, yes, it was just data that was local to the Burlington Police Department. But they're, they have this uh, um, program called Sharing or Share Officers, where there's officers in Chittenden County area that can come into Burlington and give tickets like pull people over, um, respond to calls, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that was, that had started long before my tenure began at the city of Burlington. Um, so there was some, some things that had to come from the outside of the Burlington police department, but not very much. Um, and it was only if we wanted to grab some of that data from, uh, those other police departments like South Burlington is, is what's coming to mind. I know we use them a lot in Burlington. Got it. Thank you. Um, if you could pick two or three recommendations, uh, you know, to to be able to put up to the state legislature of things that you feel would be better implemented as state policies, what do you feel that they would be? One would be recommendation one point one eight point two. Um, considering instituting a citizen review board um, to review internal and external investigations um, rather than having the chief serve as a fin final authority 
on those facts and the discipline. Um, I think that that one is incredibly important to black and brown people, uh, not just in Burlington, but across Vermont. Um, it, it, one of the things that I learned living in Vermont is that per capita, Vermont uh, incarcerates more black people than any other state in the United States of America. And um, I, I think that this, having someone have, have a citizen review board to review these instances of uh, whether it's complaint or internal and external investigations would go, would go a long way um, in helping the state of Vermont uh, figure out um, why they are incarcerating Black people at such a high, high rate. Um, the other one, so I, I don't believe in implicit bias. I don't think it exists. Um, I think that it, it is typically used. One second, please. Sorry, I think my cat is like rattling something. Um, so um, I don't believe in implicit bias. Um, I, I think that is a scapegoat that people use to say, oh, everybody has it. And, you know, it's, it's subconscious, it's unconscious, and there's nothing we can really do about it. Um, but the, uh, the recommendation is to say that they need to have implicit bias training courses. Um, I would change that to say they need to have anti-racism training courses. Um, because there's no reason why you need to be trained to treat someone like a human being. And so when we get down to the core of what, what racism is, it is our fight to be considered human beings. Um, we are still three fifths of a human being to a lot of people in this country. And so I believe that, um, uh, training people to treat other people like human beings is ludicrous, but training people to, uh, understand where, racism comes in and understand that they have been taught racism and understand that racism is the fabric of, of United States of America, then we can start there. Um, and, and then we can be able to move and, and try to shift and change um, what's happening throughout the country. Um, implicit bias training is not gonna do that. But I do like that they put training in to um, call out racism, but without calling out specifically racism. Um, I think that those two would be great for um, the state of Vermont to pick up. Thank you. Um, yeah, actually, something that, that comes up for me, as you said, that second recommendation, um, is just sort of the, you know, the fact that police in the first place were invented to catch slaves and um, and hunt indigenous folks. And I don't know the, how many people actually know that. So um, definitely worth e examining the history as we talk about criminal justice, examining the history of criminal justice itself in this country um, and thinking about approaching or training from an anti-racist perspective. Shay, uh, Shay, sorry, Sheila, is there anything you would like to add or ask before we open it up to the rest of the the panel? Um, not at this moment. You do an excellent job with she. And if something comes to mind, um, maybe can we loop back around? But the questions have been really thorough and your presentation has been really great. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, anyone else from the panel um, would like to ask questions? Or presenters, if you have questions as well. Or observers, those fly on the walls. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Taisha. I really appreciate um, everything that you were able to to provide for us. One thing is reading it. Another is hearing it. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Taisha. Are you going to stick around for um, Shay and M's portions too? I, I can, yeah. I just, I'm, I'm curious to hear what they have to say and how it might inform a question that I I know I have for you, but then I, I was hoping I could wait until the end, if, if you're willing to stick around. Absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. M. Shay, I think that was your cue. Hello. Um, if you could just, um, just one more time, names, pronouns, affiliation, uh, the role that you played in the community safety reviews and how or why did you get involved? No big deal. Um, you want to start? You want me to start? Um, would you be up for starting, Shay? 
I am Shay. I use they, them pronouns. I was a co-facilitator and co-author of the Brattleboro Community Safety Review Project. Other affiliations include uh, uncle, scholar, puppeteer, and uh, survivor support worker by day. Many things by night. Uh, and I was a former collective member at the Root Social Justice Center before it transitioned to being a BIPOC-led exclusively group. Um, so much congrats to you, Sheila, on the big anniversary. Can't wait to party with y'all. Um, the um, You should introduce yourself and then we can get started on how it got started. Sure, thanks. Um, I'm M or Emily, either is fine. I use she or they pronouns, either is fine. Um, I am a uh, somatic trauma therapist in private practice. So uh, I am also was one of the co-facilitators of the um, Community Safety Review Project with Shay in 2020. Wow. Um, and have followed through to some degree till present day. Uh, the impact of that review. Um, I also have been involved in, um, I've, I've been a leader in community mental health in Brattleboro for years before transitioning to private practice and also have been involved in several different community organizing efforts throughout the um, bit more than a decade that I've been in the area. Um, this being This being one of them. So that's sort of why I'm, why I'm showing up here. Um, yeah, and I also want to say thank you, Taisha. It was like really amazing to hear you share about Burlington's project. I a uh, lot of resonance, a lot of differences, and a lot of similarities. So I'm um, looking forward to exploring that. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Echoing that, thanks. I've read about your work a bit, and I'm so grateful to meet you and hear from you about your work directly. Thank the, you so much. Yeah. The genesis of the the project was similar and different, I would say, in Brattleboro. Similar um, timing, probably, and like larger cultural impetus. Twenty twenty, um, the murder of George Floyd, and more people um, in the Brattleboro area um, getting organized and active around um, harms from police. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Emily or Sheila or Weechi, y'all were there, but um, it was sort of like an ad hoc community coming together, lots of sort of multiracial organizing, coalitional, um, organic coming together to try to put pressure on the select board to uh, make some change, which uh, kind of shook out into a uh, negotiation toward between this ad hoc community organizing and the select board of Brattleboro into a request for proposals to do a review and make some recommendations. Um, and please, please do. Well, from a timeline perspective, add one more thing in. Um, thank you for that, which is that, um, you know, whereas it sounds like Burlington's impetus had to do with a resolution that was that was created and passed. One of the things that happened in Brattleboro um, when the COVID pandemic hit is that it disrupted what is a sort of a unique little political process that occurs in Brattleboro, which is the representative town meeting, where we have town representatives, myself and Sheila are our service town representatives. Um, that meeting usually happens in March. And March of 2020, that meeting didn't happen because of the pandemic um, and the state of emergency that was initiated. And one of the many things that happens at that meeting is that the, the town budget is passed. And so that meeting never happened. There was never a backup solution to that. And we got really close to the beginning of the fiscal year, July 1st. Um, and the select board in Brattleboro went ahead and um, passed an emergency uh, budget essentially passed the budget through an emergency declaration, which was a um, which um, did not follow the the usual protocols um, of going to the RTM, the representative town meeting body, um, and therefore community members through their representative town meeting members were not able to um, 
have the usual discord and debate that occurs at that meeting around the use of the budget. This is, of course, happening in the wake of um, George Floyd and the uprisings in response to police brutality and, viol and violence. And the, that emergency budget that was passed included a significant increase to the police budget. So that became a really huge factor in our local organizing around um, what Shay was then speaking to, what sort of came frankly down to a compromise of this review process because the budget had already been passed for the next fiscal year um, due to this emergency process. And so instead of making changes to the police budget or the budget or moving through any kind of process to do that for the emergency budget that was passed, what what was decided on was that there would be, we would in, the town would implement a, a Brattleboro police review of some kind. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um... And part of that request for proposals that we put in, some other people put in, ours was selected, included um, that this would happen through a town committee in open meeting style or be guided by a town committee with M&I as non-committee member facilitators, basically. So we facilitated um, a community safety review committee through the town, you know, open meeting structure. Um, Pros and cons to that structure for this type of work. Happy to dig in later differently about that if anybody's interested. Um, but that group of people was really um, pulled from communities who are most policed um, as much as possible and um, paid a small stipend, a tragically small stipend um, as determined by the select board, not by me. And um, guided some of the process and m and facilitated that process. And it was, the process was largely twofold, a listening project, uh, focusing on um, listening to parts of our community that are most policed, specifically black people and other people of color and um, disabled people, people who are mad or psychiatrically labeled or um, have experienced psychiatric involvement, people who've include who've experienced systems involvement in, of other kinds. Um, taking a look at not just the police department, but also policing systems gen more generally. That includes DCF, that includes the mental health system that that psychiatrically incarcerates people, et cetera. And then also aside from this large listening project where we listen to how many people, Emily? 250 communities, maybe yeah. 25 organizations, maybe. Um, also, Emily really largely led a deep dive into the policies and procedures of the Brattleboro Police Department and did a sort of analysis of their data and policy. And then we wrote a behemoth report that was massive and deep and long. That included a lot of uh, qualitative stories and information from people about their experience with policing. Yeah, and Thank I'll just you. add to that. Thank you, Shay, for saying that. And I'll just add that the <clears throat> the listening project that was really led by Shay, the listening side of things, we came up with a uh, four different ways in which we were going to gather information. So we did an anonymous survey that anybody could access and that was sent out far and wide and that we sort of did some outreach around. We did um, small listening groups that were based on identity-based or ex shared experience base. We collaborated heavily with organizations like The Root and other organizations that serve folks who are most heavily policed um, to do what we can to enter into those spaces as safely as possible to, um, participate and to gather some information about not only people's experience of harm, but also their visions for safety. Um, and we very much recognize throughout this process that we are white bodied people coming to this work with strong anti-racist lens and perspective um, and orientation. However, you know, we can't take off our whiteness and also, um, one of the ways that we navigated that is that we worked with, um, as much as possible, we paid and 
facilitated like for other people to facilitate and gather this information and then give it to us de-identified um, so that even though the information we ultimately received and and then decoded and and um, shared with the community and with the select board through the report was de-identified that we offered a few different layers of de-identification so even the information and data that we got from these listening sessions could be de-identified if that's what felt safest and most accessible for folks. Um, another form of listening that we did was one-on-one -on -one conversations, phone calls. Shay had many, many, many phone calls and um, with uh, individuals. We also paid um, a few BIPOC uh, Black facilitators to be able to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people who didn't feel safe talking to Shay or I because of our whiteness. Um, and then, or any other reason. And then... Um, we, the fourth and final format for listening were public forums held via open meeting laws. And this was at a time, everything was virtual because of where we were at in the pandemic. And um, so we had these public forums that served as, as sort of sharing and community building um, opportunities, as well as opportunities for us to continue to gather. People shared experiences of their personal experiences of their um the personal experiences with harm in Brattleboro and also um, their visions for safety. And in addition to all that, we also talked to a ton of people who work inside of these systems. We talked to police. We talked to people who work at DCF. We had a DCF listening session for our local office. We talked to folks who work in the mental health system about their perspectives on how the system is going from the inside. And when given anonymity, people had a lot of really interesting things to share about their own the state's attorney's office all kinds of folks um so that was the bulk of it <laughs> i think the process i want to say one more thing about how we got there which is just that emily and i had the time as freelancers ish to be able to do it ish we didn't really but we did have the time to do it sort of uh and it was sort of a community effort to like figure out who was gonna put in the proposal and who would be selected. And we did recognize whiteness as a barrier to, um, you know, being yes. fully embedded in some ways. And we are both people from within the Brattleboro community who've done multiracial organizing for a long time. And so there were some proposals from like far out groups, like, uh, you know, firms, international firms that worked with Wells Fargo, wanted to come in and do stuff. And it turned out that we, you know, we're our proposal was selected which sort of came out of that organizing group. So that's kind of how we became the people to hold this. Thank you both. I can understand why it became a behemoth of a report. Uh, <laughs> that was That's a lot, a lot, a lot of work. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I wanted to ask maybe about the impacts of your work. Uh, maybe you can talk a little bit about what kind of thing, what kind of positive impacts you've seen on the community, uh, especially BIPOC, since this is a lot having to do with racial disparities in our panel, but talking about positive impacts in the communities uh, that came from uh, that, came that from report. That report. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thanks for that question, Michi. Um, Right after the report came out, one of the main features or uh, one of the main areas of, of study and therefore recommendation and findings and recommendations of this report has a lot to do with the impact of the, the coupling of police policing and mental health response to um, in, in Brattleboro, the impact of that on community members. And one of the greatest impacts um, that we saw right after this report came out was a sort of a, a real sort of like stepping on the brakes of that um, moving train of of coupling mental health response or welfare checks with uh, police response. Um, <clears throat> over, you know, I have to look at the data, but a good a good um, portion of the use of force um, incidents that occurred in the time span that we studied the two years prior to the review. Um, a significant portion of them, and I can look at the data and tell you more specifically, were responding to welfare checks um, and not criminal activity, actually. Um, and so the willingness to really analyze and look at that 
that the concerns and risks associated with having police respond to um, what were being called welfare checks or mental health calls um, has, I think, positively impacted a lot of community members, including BIPOC folks. Um, I, you know, we haven't seen a lot of the recommendations be implemented, to be honest. Um, the town manager who was in the office at the time, the first set of recommendations were to acknowledge and reckon with the harm caused um, that was uncovered and spoken about, recognizing that people were really taking a big risk sharing their experiences with us. Um, one of the big risks is that no change might happen, right? Um, and I think that at that time, there were some steps taken by the town manager who was in office at the time to really, to really reckon with and acknowledge that, you know, institutionalized racism and white supremacy are in fact part of the picture here um, in regards to policing and, and town government elsewhere. We've had a lot of turnover in all of our positions of leadership uh, associated with the police department, including the town manager so a few times now. So that's made it in really hard chief. for momentum. And the police chief. I'm sorry. There's and also police chief, yeah. the police chief. Um, and of course the select board has been, you know, reelected new people. So there's been a ton of turnover right. leadership. Right. And I'll just say one more positive impact, I think, um, is the the deepening of camaraderie and collaboration among community members and um, community organizations who are organizing for racial justice. This project really provided a place to coalesce shared energy and shared vitality around um, the impact of uh, white supremacy and racism. Um, in our communities. And so, for example, we still have a lot of momentum in, the, in our organizing community around this project. And um, there's a monthly meeting happening for uh, organizers who have been involved in this process for three years now to continue to organize around what, how to support the town in following through with accountability of the project and also accountability to implementation of the the table, uh, the implementation plan. Yeah. Thank, thank you. I don't know if um, Shay or Sheila, you'd want to add anything to that. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, I agree with you that the that um, I think that the majority of the positive impacts that I've heard about, interestingly, are not at the select board level or the police department level, but are rather at organizational levels where organizations working in social services looked at these implement, you know, at the, at these recommendations and are implementing as much as they can to sort of decarcerate internally, um, et cetera. I think personally that the town, you know, the select board's commitments to these recommendations were quite soft, I would say, soft commitments. A little hard to uh, hold somebody to a real soft, smushy. Yes, we've we we promise that we will look at this. You know, um, uh, some things have are on the way to be implemented or have been implemented, but a lot haven't. So something helpful that the town manager did was also say these are things we can't implement because of they're not at the town level. There are some things here that we can't do because of state statute. As an example, we can't decouple traffic, simple traffic stops or speeding tickets with policing. That's a Vermont statute situation that would have to change at the state level. We can't, um, with, you know, um, uh, you know, when, when an officer is um, involved in, in something, you know, harmful, we can't uh, put them on leave without pay because that's actually a national level um, you know, statute that says that we, you know, we need to give uh, government employees due process. So we can't implement some things on the town level. Um, that kind of information was really helpful and may inform, you know, that implementation of table is available for y'all and may inform the work that you do on the state level. Um, there are opportunities there for sure. But quite a lot of what we talked about was at the town level, the lo local level. Thank you. Sheila, do you have anything to add? 
Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, how impactful this was for our youth in our community. Youth were mm -hmm. um, a huge part of those listening sessions and those groups. And what I think it also did for the youth and the youth organizers doing anti-racist work is to, <laughs> excuse me, to for people to recognize the um, connection between school and community and how mm -hmm. that is the same in one really and it gave the youth who were at the time trying to have police out of schools it's a big statewide campaign many of you might know about it and because we were implementing something in the community which was asking to look at different alternatives of policing and saying that police are not the only way to uh, create safety in our communities. It really brought credence and support to our youth within the school systems to not have police in the school systems as well. So I think to, to um, in addition to what Shay is saying, those organizations and our groups now had not only more people power, but more substance as well with policy, with people, but also having the backup of all this sort of research and understanding as well to say, hey, if how can we do this in our schools if the community is doing this? Right, and the youth led their own listening session. Um, youth participated in, in, in leading and asking their own, you know, other youth for info. Um, and yeah, and we're doing, a, you know, parallel adjacent work um, on their own around um, the impacts of police presence in the high school in Brattleboro as well. Yeah, which is one of the reports that um, we've been reviewing as well. Um, I didn't quite know that that was a direct influence. So that's, that's cool to um, to know that that was one of the impacts. Rebecca, I think you had your hand up first, but you put it down. Oh, thanks, Witchy. I, I, I got us some of the answers. I Thanks for coming and sharing all of this information. It's hugely helpful. Uh, I'll, I'll focus the questions, I know time is short, on your point as to follow up on of the report and the dedication of people meeting monthly to discuss implementation, how to hold the town accountable. And I just heard how you've learned that there are certain things that can only be done at a state level, statewide level. Do you have, or maybe I'm missing it somewhere in another in a report, um, recommendations from these monthly meetings as to how these local uh, organizations, government organizations can be held more accountable and uh, implement the recommendations of the report? Are you guys compiling specific recommendations? And if so, I think we would love to see them. Um, yeah, that's great to hear. Thank you for your question and for your interest. Um, I'll say that the formal monthly meetings are just starting next what Monday because we've had several kind of ad hoc reactive meetings, you know, reacting to um governmental opportunities or lack thereof frankly for community involvement in decision making around how this implementation process happens one of the greatest challenges we face to anticipate the next question um that you you know um that you that you sent to us is the turnover that we've experienced in town in the town the 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 great degree of turnover we've seen in the town manager's office in the police department and the select board has made it very difficult for it's not that there aren't individuals that could theoretically you know hold the thread of accountability but there's been a lot of opportunity to not have to do that because there's been a lot of reprioritization um and this has consistently gotten kind of kicked down the road as a priority um, for all kinds of reasons, right? You know, no judgment on on those reasons, but um, consistently, the, the the town manager who was in place, Peter Elwell, at the time that the report was happened, was very supportive and um, was was moving pretty quickly around think relatively around implementation. Created a town generated implementation table based on the recommend findings and recommendations table that we had, which like what Shay was saying, told us directly, these are things we can't address because they're not at the town level, but these are the things we can address and created a timeline, an implementation timeline that was extremely swift and responsive. Um, it really dissolved and is now uh, heavily contested by the, um, you know, by the current folks in those 
positions that have a say. Um, so that's just been really challenging. And it's why those of us organizing around anti-racist work um, are sort of holding our own piece of accountability. This report is very helpful, not just for the town, it's very helpful for anybody organizing in the town around um, anti-racist work and um, you know, dealing with the impact of police brutality and, and policing on our community. And so there's just a lot of good information in here that we also get to work with. And frankly, because one of the largest recommendations has to do with um, investing in and supporting community responses to safety and harm, and, and therefore um, decentering police responses. That work needs to be done. One of the confusing things about this is that we just keep trying to get the police to do things or not do things, but we're actually talking about decentering the police when we talk about safety. And that's something we didn't mention at the beginning. While this has a police review part of it, where we reviewed two years of data and policies and practices and procedures. Also, we really we really put this forth in our proposal as a review of safety and harm and not policing, because we really see the hyper focus on police as a bit of a red herring or a, bar a barrier to really looking at what we're talking about is what makes communities safe. And, you know, even our police department says, you know, I've, I've had many conversations with folks in our police department, you know, some of our police department members understand better than many of us that you know, things get delegated and relegated to the police because they're the 24 hour responders in town. And, you know, I have a quote here from our, our chief saying like, we didn't ask to be mental health experts. We never were mental health experts. And once we became the go-to mental health responders, there was great tragedy associated with that. That's from that's from the mouth of the chief of police for several decades in Brattleboro. So, you know, a lot of this work actually is about community and community perception and community perceptions of safety. And that's a huge struggle we have in Brattleboro where community perceptions of safety have to do with things like commerce and things like our downtown um, businesses and, and maybe the people who are experiencing harm and experiencing a lack of safety on a regular basis aren't centered in that conversation on a daily basis and certainly not usually centered in town government conversations. And those meetings, they're ongoing. There are no new recommendations coming out of those meetings. The That's organizers thinking about the the recommendations that already exist and how to to um, be in the now with those and keep it moving. Um, I will say around government accountability generally and police accountability generally, that uniquely differently in Brattleboro than in Burlington, there has been a community um, oversight of the police body that has been radically toothless i would say toothless than more toothless than a than a 30 year old cat it is it is not doing anything for anybody and they say that's from listening to that group they acknowledge that themselves right? like it's not working the form of it that's happening in brattleboro is not working um there's no process there's no continuity there's no accountability in the community accountability uh for the police um here so one of our our recommendations was to revise or re or eliminate that um that false sense of accountability that this specific form of that committee was um providing um also m m and i have our whole own other careers than this um, and there was no single organization that housed this project. The, the beauty of the coalition is also the risk of lack of continuity, right? No one, no single org bottom lining. And so it has been this reactive process since then to say, ah, they're going to like, you know, go against what they said that they were going to do again. Let's all get together and go to that meeting. But there hasn't been like a very strong through line. So we're working on it. I see... Thanks. Thank, <laughs> yes. Thank you both for, for this amazing insight. There's definitely some powerful stuff that, that's coming out of that. I'm going to ask Ta Taisha Green to come up. Thank you. Um, yeah, that was really great. Um, I saw a bunch of um, parallels with um, what's going on in Brattleboro and what happened in Burlington. Um, one of which is like moving away from policing, like um, trying to reimagine 
what public safety actually looks like and and policing is is a very small part of that i would say that policing has um nothing to do with it but it, it is a very small part of it because i know people like to hold on to uh feeling safe um with police um but there are there's a subset of people who do not and have never and probably will never feel safe with police um so i do like that y'all were thinking about decentering police because that's what the original resolution in Burlington was about. Um, the uh, uh, no police in schools. I I really thought that Burlington was the only ones that had police in schools and I was really happy that they were removed from those schools. Um, I did ask a question about what other towns uh, in Vermont had police in their schools. Is it, is it all schools across Vermont or is it just the schools that have a significant number of black and brown kids in them. Um, because we, uh, there was a school that's in Chittenden County and I'm sorry, I'm not that familiar with it, but, um, but there was a school in Chittenden County that was a hundred percent white um, and they had no police officers in it. And so I think that the presence of black people, the presence of brown people is what encourages that. Um, although uh, most school shootings happen from white individuals. So that's really interesting. Um, uh, and the last thing that I wanted to say was the community oversight of the police in, in Burlington. Uh, <laughs> that that group has no authority, and which is why um, in this um, CNA report, one of the recommendations is to give that group a, a high level of authority. Um, that actually passed city council and the mayor vetoed it. So. Um, the mayor does not want um, community oversight of the police and neither does the police department. And so um, this report, unfortunately, even though it has a, over 150 recommendations, it's a very well thought out, thoughtful report, sits on the shelf. When I left the city of Burlington, nothing has moved forward on any of these recommendations, and I don't think they intend to. Um, and, and that's really sad because there was a lot of work that went into this report as well as the community-led um, report. That's all. Thank you for giving me that time. Yeah, of course. Yeah, thank, you thank you for for naming those comparisons. Just my last question for uh, Shane M, and then I'll open it up to the rest of the panel. Um, uh, I was I was wondering. You you all talked a lot about things that needed to happen at the state level or the federal level. For the state level, are there things that we should be considering writing into the recommendation uh, for the Vermont legislature when it comes to reducing racial disparities in our criminal justice system? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Shay, do you mind if I say some things first here? Okay. So the first thing that I recommend, you may or may not be familiar with a report that was written by Stephanie Seguino from the University of Vermont, um, Trends in Racial Disparities in Traffic Stops. And she did this, that they, they um, you know, analyzed this data across the state. Brattleboro and Burlington were among the highest uh, rates, uh, and Rutland, I think, were among the highest, highest rates of um, Trend of racial disparities, and they're alarming. They're extremely alarming. Um, I think addressing traffic stop related uh, racial disparities has huge implications and also probably would need to be taken up at the state level. It seems like the lo local municipalities don't have the, you know, vision or, you know, scope to be able to address this, but um, there are some really radical uh, pilot programs like one in Berkeley, California, where they're looking at decoupling traffic stops and police response, uh, which would involve the creation of a different type of muni municipal um, department that is not armed to be uh, issuing traffic violations and, and things like that, uh, recognizing on a national level how um, dangerous the coupling of armed police response and traffic stops are. And in our own community, how much we saw, we heard from Black folks in our town about the experience of being profiled over and over and over again um, through traffic stops. So uh, as well as many other experiences, but traffic stops were a big one. So that's one thing I would say to look at. The other thing that I want to echo what Taisha said is that a big recommendation that just kind of blew the minds of 
the folks in power down here um, and was really hard to articulate is that we recommended a freeze in the training budget because one of the things that was happening, and this sort of for me lands in the like good, trying to be good white people category. One of the things that keeps happening is that like there's some layer of recognition that there's some kind of problem happening without a deep analysis or, you know, a sort of receiving of the deep analysis that is already in process. And so there's a bit of a like, let's throw money at it, let's throw training at it. And um, we did some analysis of the training budget and this sort of like response to increasing the training budget by 48 percent um to sort of increase implicit bias training uh, which sort of looks good on paper but actually has really really poor um outcomes uh, when you look at the the data around the effectiveness of implicit bias training usually when people leave an implicit bias training we're talking about you know an eight hour training right um that uh you know 24 hours later, usually people have retained almost nothing of what they of they learned and, and of what they learned. And I, I really believe in my work um, as a psychologist, as a um, psychological provider and uh, focus on anti oppressive work, um, that a lot of this has to do with readiness. And one of the things when we did listening sessions with the police officer, there was a perception among the police officers that they were heavily trained in DEI. And it's that perception does not match what's actually happening, right? Um, it was a, a pretty aggressive perception, actually, I will say. Um, and the what they felt like they needed was more firearms training. They get a lot more firearms training than they get DEI training at the time of the of the two two a, a year span of review. And um they actually many of them aren't using firearms. I mean, they're obviously armed, but they're, you know, in terms of how many times a firearms is drawn in those two years is um, compared to how many times they may be interacting with a person of color, right? And so um, the readiness, you know, what our recommendation was really about having the police department actually look at readiness, individual officer readiness for anti-racism training, rather than throwing a 48% increase in the budget to just force all these officers who are, many of them not super interested in going to this training um, to just check the box. It really felt like that. And it was really confusing for folks to say, wait a minute, you want us to be less racist, but you don't want us to go to training. And it's like, no, first of all, there was a 60% redu reduction in use of the training budget. So they wanted to increase the training budget by 48%, but that year they had used like 60% less of the training budget than they had used the year before, right? So it was, it really felt like a box checking rather than a, a sort of critical analysis of what it actually means to, you know, train police officers in anti-racism, right? So that's just something I wanna illustrate across the state to really be careful about, again, what I sort of chalk up to the, the sort of good white person response of like, let's, let's put more money, let's put more resources, let's get more training. And to really look at what actually makes training effective is like a readiness and a willingness for the person to be trained in the topic, to pay attention, to listen, and to integrate the information as well as opportunities for integration and learning, not just, you know, an eight hour training and then you're sort of check the box, you're trained in this. And this is really important because a lot of the use of force documents start off, like have straight up routine sentence starters, like, you know, my training in mental health first aid tells me that blah, blah, blah. And so these trainings kind of get used as justification for the implementation of use of force, the mental health trainings. And so there's just really a lot of concerns that are really subtle if you don't kind of hard to think about right away. It sounds good to do DUI, DEI training, but to really look at the impact of that training. Quickly, one other recommendation that people get confused about a lot that's related is that we heard about the very negative impacts of having a social work liaison embedded in the police department. The public perception of that is that, oh, there's a social worker at the police department. That means that that's the person who alone is going to go and deal with the mental health calls. And that'll just gentle everything down, right? Because it's a social worker. And so what has social workers ever done wrong? Um, they're they're good guys in this gentle framework, right? Um, the, the functionality of that in our community is not that the social worker is going alone to any wellness checks. It's that it's a faster path 
to psychiatric incarceration for predominantly the most marginalized people in our community, black people, brown people, disabled people. Um, and that a lot of harm was happening within that pathway to get, again, slow down and really think about, is this actually increasing the power of the system or not? Is this actually creating a decoupled support that people don't have to engage with policing? If it's not for the police, can we decouple any of these things from the police? And adding more stuff to the police is, is a very different strategy. And just to be thoughtful about that as those proposals are coming down in your own communities. Um, are there ways for people to engage totally voluntarily in supports that might cre create safety? That was a lot of our recommendations, our fund totally voluntary, community-led supports. That's where people are finding safety in our community. Black people are finding safety at the Root Social Justice Center and Susu Community Farm more than they are at the retreat or the police. Thank you. That was that was really helpful. And uh, can we just get a clarification when you talk about training and training budget? We are you talking municipal or are you tra talking state training? Yeah, great question. Um, I don't know because I don't know the source of all of the trainings that folks are being offered. I was provided a list of the trainings that again really showed up in the data as like a check check this person went to this training this is the title of the training um so i'm not i'm not sure where the the trainings are being sourced from um i think it's a mix i think there's a mix of municipal well there's a mix of definitely like statewide and and more national and some municipal trainings one of the recommendations that we made um to sort of shift the energy a little bit from these trainings to building community relationships with organizations that serve BIPOC folks, uh, psychiatrically labeled and mad people, um, you know, people who use drugs, right? Like that, that some of that energy and time can actually go towards building co coalition building within, which is a tricky, tricky thing for the police to do, right? So that has to be, we provided a little bit of thought around this, but in terms of like, you know, recognizing that police, there's a lot of people like Taisha said, who the police will never be safe. Um, or feel safe to contact the police or to collaborate with the police, right? Um, and so we also need to see some, you know, acknowledgement of that. But I think I offer that to you all at the state level, because I think the state is probably as liable to make these mistakes, well, you know, as any municipality is, to sort of throw DEI training at a problem, uh, throw money at, you know, training money, training budget money at this problem. And I think that a deeper analysis of each department's readiness and how do you get police officers ready to do anti-racism work? Like, let's have that conversation. Um, it's a cultural, it's a huge cultural shift that we're not going to be able to get in an eight hour training. Um, sorry you. to interrupt. Um, I just am trying to be mindful of the clock as, as yep. loath as I am to do this, that, because this is really such a valuable I mean, really just so grateful for you all being here and sharing what you've learned. It's really eye opening and it's a lot of food for thought, like a lot. So um, I also wish Sheila Linton and Witchy are too good luck with <laughs> the subcommittee's work in trying to figure out like, how do we, how do we share all of this information out and what does our RPAC want to do with all of it next? But um, I don't want I also don't want to just completely interrupt. It just really we have two other subcommittees we need to get to too. So maybe we can take um, Chief Stevens questions and then if there's any last thoughts from our guests um, before we'll turn to the other subcommittees. It's more of a statement than a question. Almost almost no law enforcement ever asked for any cultural competency from the indigenous community. I have I can tell you I've I've done a lot of cultural competency in the prisons because they want to deal with cultural practices once someone is incarcerated. But I just wanted to mention that obviously we don't have the same profiling as black and brown people do, but it's no less an issue when it comes to poverty and people taking your kids and doing all kinds of other things that I've had to be involved with. I just want to say that most of the time, we're often overlooked on 
DEI training, BIPOC, all kinds of things never trickle down to the indigenous people. And I just don't want us to lose sight that we are often uh, marginalized within the same community of, of, of that work. So I just wanted to at least state that and uh, hopefully that, that changes as well. Thank you. Thank you for, for reminding of that, us of that too. That's one reason we really appreciate you coming to these meetings, Chief. Um, Elizabeth, did you want to add something? I was just going to offer, um, I'm part of the JJ subcommittee, which is, I believe, next on the agenda. And I just want to say that, you know, I, I'm so thankful for our guests here today. So I want to say, you know, we are happy to be moved to the next the next month if that's appropriate. And I think I think I want to honor all of the work and the time and the questions that are here. So I'm just speaking on behalf of 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 our subcommittee, but that's great. I appreciate that. We would we would probably need to bump somebody anyway at this point. <laughs> we would at least have to bump the conversation about what is our homework. I know everyone's gonna be sad about that. Um Okay, so maybe that can, we'll take you up on that, Elizabeth and Tyler, we'll move you to the October meeting. Um, that's, I think that's a welcome offer. Thank you, Jeffrey. And, but I still do want to get to the second look folks too. So go ahead, Jeffrey, though. Um, I have perhaps uh, unique and bizarre reasons for being on this board uh, panel. I was the first black policeman in Vermont, and I was a trooper. And I think the strongest area to have impact over the long term is to put appropriate people on the hiring panels. And you can't train a bad horse. And it's kind of that simple to me. It's come down to that. I don't know if the chief would agree, but um, I've never seen any of his people on a hiring board. And when they put me on a hiring board, they quickly slid me off. Um, that's a whole nother movie. I'd be happy to speak to anybody about what the inside looks like. There were a lot of years where I was the only black police officer in Vermont and I got jacked up and stopped all the time because that's what the movie is. Only I had resources. I had sufficient resources to have an attitude and not get shot too, which didn't hurt. That sounds like an exaggeration, but trust me, it's not. Thank you for sharing that, Jeffrey. Do our guests want to wrap it up with any last comments, thoughts? I'm glad you all addressed the accountability issue. I, that was on the top of my mind when Taisha was speaking. I just want to say one thing before I leave. Um, first, thank you for inviting me to to this. I uh, I appreciated talking about it. Um, haven't done it in over a year. So thank you for that. Um, the thing that I wanted to talk about was just safety and, and keep in mind that word safety and and what that means. And I think, you know, if you look across the whole the country and you can see what a safe neighborhood is versus what people have deemed a not so safe neighborhood. And it's all it all boils down to social determinants of health. And if we can focus um, as like legislators, leaders, et cetera, on increasing the social determinants of health for black, brown, LGBTQIA folks, indigenous folks, um, honoring treaties of indigenous folks. If we can like focus on those social determinants of health, then your neighborhoods will start to look very differently. Then you won't be able to tell a bad neighborhood from a good neighborhood or a white neighborhood from a black neighborhood or you know, uh, an indigenous reservation for a non, you, you won't be able to tell because you have healthy human beings inside of that. What we are talking about is a system that has is so complex that has tied up legislation into ensuring that black and brown people will never be healthy people, um, ensuring that um, our demise 
and and we have continued to survive. So since we are continuing to survive, um, you're not going to kill us off. We tried to do that with the indigenous folks, didn't work. Um, since we can't be killed off, why not focus our energies on making sure that everyone is a healthy individual? Um, and the last thing that I want to say is, you know, I would really love for this country to move away from policing. Um, I think that, you know, because of its origins, uh, the police officers are still out here catching slaves and, and, and it's not okay. And so we have to abolish that system as we know it. And if we want some kind of public safety apparatus, we need to rebuild it um, without having um, what the, the first black police officer, that gentleman just spoke, um, saying that he was a police officer and he was targeted himself, but he had resources. Now everybody has those resources. So we're out here still causing harm to a lot of people that we've always caused harm to. So why don't we abolish that system of harm and build something different? Um, because it's clearly not working. And and so those are those are the things. Social determinants of health, build everybody up. Let's let's find a new way to to um, protect people. And the people, and I'm not saying that we're never going to have any criminals or people who do harm to other people or, you know, people who are very violent people, but those people are also not throwaway people and they also need some kind of help. And, and we have to start thinking about it in that way instead of locking people away because when they come out, they're still that same person that they were when they went in. So we need to figure figure that out. We can't just throw people in, in cages and throw away the key. That's all I have. Um, thank you for letting me speak and give me the, the floor to do so. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Shay. And thank you, Em, for all the work you've done too. Um, Witchy, I mean, I wanna, um, yeah, I want to I want to share that we are, um, you know, not working on this full time or for money anymore, but are somewhat reachable, you know, capacity allowing. And that I think uh, the the report that we're talking about is really big, but there's some um, shorter ways to access that kind of info if you're looking for like an, an in route. We can't use the chat, but one of them is the implementation table that the town put forth. That's each recommendation. Does it happen at the town level or the state level? And what's the commitment? It's old, but it's something if you're just trying to get into like the nitty gritty. And there's also like key findings and recommendations instead of the whole deep dive. The deep dive does include a lot of really sad, valuable stories um, and good ones too and visions. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, I know it's a lot to think about uh, reimagining, as Taisha is talking about, completely reimagining how especially white people are thinking about what safety means. Uh, and it's really, really important work that we can do together. We can break stuff down and make changes in our communities that are not just kind of like putting more money into things that are not working. So really, really grateful for y'all and your labor. And I hope that you can take a look at some of what Taisha has done in, you know, and what, what we've done and um, keep it moving. Thank you. Richie and Sheila, thanks for making this happen too. Do you have any last thoughts? I just want to thank Taisha and um, M and Shay for coming on here and d continuing to do the work, even though y'all ain't getting paid and for doing the work in the first place and for just being real. I really appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. Yeah, just wanting to to add gratitude, uh, not just for everything that got named, but also for the amount of emotional work it takes to stand up, um, not just in a committee full of uh, people with authority, but also every day in this kind of process and every day in the, that every day that passes is just more and more emotional work of having to keep ourselves together so we can help keep our communities together so just really appreciating that unnamed uh labor thank you thank you especially your labor taisha i know what <laughs> you know i know the i know the vt digger level at least of what's been going on up there and i'm yeah Send you big props and love thank you i appreciate that thank you so much thank you everybody
Have much a good gratitude. Night. Thank you, everyone, so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Jeffrey, I see your hand is still up, but I didn't know if it was, if you had another thought you want to share or if it's just from before. Thinking it's maybe. ignorance on how to bring down my hand. <laughs> okay. And it no uh, probably has something to do with my total accuracy in, in the way I act. Um, <laughs> just ignore me like everyone else does, okay? <laughs> I would never want to do that. Um, okay, then I think we can hand it over to Rebecca. Rebecca, you don't have a lot of time. Do you want to report out this evening or do you want to report out um, uh, in October? You know, Aaron, let me let me just take because this is a lot. <laughs> it's a lot to think about. I almost feel like it's, it's what I want us to sit on this, but I, I think I want to share just five, like five minutes if people can hand hold in there and hang in there and then ask Aton to put this on the agenda for October because there's a lot to talk about. Um, that sounds good. Thank you. And I agree. We're, we've all just heard a lot and there's a lot to think about. So. Um, I appreciate yeah, your, I know. It's an approach, your it's an approach to move forward a little bit, but yeah, we'll come back to this in October as well. All right. So five minutes. Um, so, so changing our approach, uh, reminding this panel of why second look, we wanted to think about recommendations that we could have that address uh, racial disparities for people who are already identified both by the police, already convicted and sentenced, right? Already subjected to the juvenile and criminal court systems. And so um, second look, of course, is um, a generalized uh, idea of legislation that's been passed in various uh, states. And we have a pending bill, I think it's S-155, that was introduced last session and we heard Alex Bailey earlier this year come in from Sentencing Project to share with us the key points of that bill. At the heart of it, it is about creating an opportunity to review what is otherwise happening here in Vermont, which is perpetual and unreviewable sentences. And when I say unreviewable, there is actually one point of review allowed in the Vermont law currently, and that's 90 days after a conviction and sentence becomes final, 90 days. So if you're sentenced to 10 years, life, life without parole, there is no statutory scheme in this state that allows for a relook, unlike other jurisdictions. So this is the concept of second look. Do we want it here? RDAP decided early on, yes, we're interested. So what the second look committee has been looking at is been dropping in on various other states' legislation in this regard. We have this wonderful law clerk from Brooklyn Law type up for us this beautiful Excel spreadsheet to compare what are the parameters, who becomes eligible, what are the target um, groups involved. Uh, you know, in no instance are people automatically meeting parameters and out, right? In no instance, it's about setting up a procedure to review people and what they've been doing on the inside um, after serving a certain amount of time. Um, so, We've been looking at that uh, consistent and parallel with this effort of education, education of subcommittee members. Uh, we also are taking um, up our RDAP mandate of educating community wide on this issue. And uh, Jess uh, Brown, who's here, um, and a panel member and really uh, a critical co-leader on the subcommittee on this front. Uh, we are, um, we talked before, before this panel about creating or working with VLS, the law school, VLGS, sorry, to um, who, who's, who's willing to host a conference uh, related to second look uh, and uh, consistent with their um, regular sort of um, events the school uh, in terms of conference planning. So this year, November 3rd, there is there are plans afoot to hold a second look conference. Uh, and we are um, in regular efforts 
uh, meeting to get that conference together. Um, and Jess, you can share if you'd like to jump in here uh, where that's at, but there are two exciting sort of pieces going on complementary to each other, all of which next month I'll come back and share sort of more specifics. Um, we're hoping to get some, some speakers, uh, national, national experts on various issues, as well as people who can drop down on Vermont specifically. Um, but all towards the end of this report that Aton reminds us is 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 quickly approaching as to what do we want to what do we want to do and say as to RDAP's recommendations as to second look. Um, and so I'll stop there. Jess, do you want to jump in? Um, I won't add too much to what Rebecca has said um, because we're still hammering out the details. But it will be November third in South Royalton at Vermont Lawn Graduate School. Um, and oh, actually, so, and we don't necessarily need to take a poll now, but like, I wanna put this question out to this group and people, you know, my email is on all of the, all of Eitan, Eitan's emails. Um, so anyone can reach out to me or Rebecca to let us know, but like, this is going to be an in-person event we're going to be bringing in speakers from mostly the around the east east coast um but we really you know and we really want butts in seats um and we're hoping to attract um stakeholders um practitioners legal practitioners legislators um representative arsenal i hope you'll be there mark your calendar um uh judges, et cetera. Um, so Judge Morrissey, please start telling your colleagues um, to mark their calendars. Um, with that said, we also want to make it as accessible as possible. And we are weighing different ideas about, um, I mean, it will definitely be recorded. The question is, will some, will some part of it maybe keynote speaker or the entirety be live streamed? And so um, Rebecca and I thought this would be a good group to sort of uh, get some feedback from on that. So like I said, um, in consideration of time right now, please feel free to reach out to me and we'll revisit this in October, but please feel free to reach out to me um, if you would like to let me know your thoughts on that. Thanks. That's great. Thank you, Second Look Subcommittee, and thank you for um, providing some updates, but also just to being able to do it in such a short time frame. Um, so next month, we will have the um, concrete discussion about forming the upcoming report, which is, that's nice. I mean, I think that kind of gives us the opportunity to um, think about everything we've heard tonight, to look forward to DCF's report as well, to hear more from Second Look, but also be thinking in the interim about what we think we would want to see in our RDAP report um, so we can have that concrete discussion at the October meeting. Um, for me, I will be having a conversation with Aton about um, this meeting, but also in general, you know, it occurs to me, I feel like we don't have a really great way of sharing everything that we've heard about in any kind of, um, I don't know, efficient or effective way. Like we've heard all, about all kinds of um, celebrations and fundraising opportunities. We've heard about reports. We've heard about a conference coming up. Um, and then where does it go? So I would, if anyone has any thoughts about that and how we can share these things in a way that works for everybody, please let me know. And I, and I'll have a conversation with Aton too, but, um, it, we just always learn such incredible information and there's always so much cool stuff going on. And then I feel like it just kind of, how do we keep track of it all and share it all in a way that is accessible to everyone? I would love some advice there. Um, with that, is there any new business before we close? Okay. Oh, Chief Stevens. I just wanted to ask a quick question. Um, <clears throat> with the second look and all the other work that's been done, I know people say when you've done your time, you know, you've done the crime, you've done your time, you should be fine. But 
we all know that those convictions follow you throughout your lifetime. Has anybody ever thought about <clears throat> coming up with a process or procedure that after a certain length of a time, after you've been convicted, you might be able to get some of that either um, expunged or um, not open to like records checks or something that gives people chances. Cause like, you know, they, people, when they've been convicted, they lose jobs, they can't be hired, you know, and it, even though they've done their time, they, they're still, that crime is still following them and it still keeps them suppressed. So I was just wondering if that's part of the consideration someday of, of also having, if they've, they've done well and haven't reoffended that they might be able to have some of that um, removed from the record. So it doesn't follow them forever. I was just curious. We do in Vermont have um, expungement and sealing laws that um, allow for record clearance, um, but it's not all of the, it's not the whole list of offenses in our criminal code. It's very few felonies for one thing. Um, and then there are a lot of parameters around what can be cleared um, when and then who could have access to any records that aren't entirely destroyed or expunged. Um, it's always an right. ongoing effort to update those laws and to try to expand record clearance. But um, I agree with you. That's a really um, important factor to helping people be able to move on past, past mistakes and not have those mistakes follow them around for the rest of their lives. Um, all right, that was mostly around drug convictions, though, wasn't it? There's um, almost all misdemeanors can be cleared from your record at some point if you meet other requirements. And then, right, for the felonies, it is primarily drug possession. Erin, can I just add that, um, mm -hmm. Chief, some of that, ex some of those expungements are supposed to be automatic. Um, but I just also want to put out there that... Um, part of the Center for Justice Reform is a clinic, and we are always working to sort of grow the services we provide to people in the community. And one of the ways we're specifically trying to do that um, in our in uh, a new iteration of this clinic is um, by providing expungement services for people. So we're always looking to um, develop partnerships with different organizations or different groups that, um, you know, uh, are engaged with uh, populations of people who might uh, have criminal records, be trying to get back into the workforce, et cetera, um, and who don't understand if they're eligible to have certain convictions expunged. And um, we, uh, like I said, are looking to build partnerships um, so that we can provide those services or access to those services for people. So again, Jay Brown at vermontlaw.edu. Uh, anyone can reach out to me to talk about any of this. Thanks. I think Sheila has her hand up, so I'm gonna pass to Sheila. Well, thanks, Jessica. Oh, sorry, I was trying to call on you, but I was muted, thank you. Um, I just wanted to also say that the Root Social Justice Center has been providing expungement clinics specifically in affinity space for BIPOC people. And we are um, just ended a four month series and we're going to be starting that back up as well. So if there's anybody in the Brattleboro area, of course, it's free. You meet with an attorney. It can be confidential. You can set up an appointment. And again, it's for um, people who identify as BIPOC. And we are partnering currently with Vermont Legal Aid on that. Um, I will say that um, many, some of the DAs I have um, worked with our DA here, which is Tracy Shiver, um, and participated in expungement clinics here. So it has been done on the DA's level. And I would really encourage you, Chief Stevens, if in your area, I don't know what exists or how that even works, but um, um, being able to maybe provide some type of clinic and information up there, either through your organizations or through um, community, other community organizations up there. The Attorney General's Office also um, has expungement clinics throughout the state. Um, 
every few months. Our next one will be in Washington County at the end of October. Um, so look for information about that. But I'm also happy to talk to any community member, or community advocate, or anyone who has questions about expungement and sealing or um, setting up expungement clinic opportunities in your community. Happy to help in any way I can with those. It's really gratifying, fun work too. Anything else? Wow, 7.58, amazing. Okay, we'll all have a lot of homework after October's meeting, but I'm gonna make Aton be the, the person giving us all homework. I don't have to do it. Um, really nice to see all of you. Thank you again to everybody who brought all of that information and incredible um, people doing incredible work in our communities. It was yet another awesome RDAP meeting. Much gratitude. Say that with enthusiasm, Erin. <laughs> um, I was I was just realizing after I was saying all of that, whatever I just said, that I we probably have to have like a motion to adjourn. I was right? going like to say, yeah, we need we a motion. I'll make get, a motion. We have to get official. That's why my voice was dropping. I was like, oh no, I'm not doing the the official part very well. Okay, Jessica Brown with a motion. I make to a adjourn. motion to adjourn. Thank I'll you. Second. second. <laughs> okay. Anyone objecting to that? All in favor. Bye. Bye. Thank you for your time. Bye.